Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. Um, I'm going to talk about medications, specifically steroid doses for children who have asthma. Medications mask symptoms but they don't address the cause of disease which is one of the reasons why people continue to get worse even while they'll re they're receiving what's considered excellent medical care. This is true for a lot of kids with asthma. Inhaled corticosteroids are commonly recommended and when kids get worse, and they often do because the bad eating, the dehydration, the extra weight they're carrying, all kinds of things are not being addressed, it's common for doctors to recommend, you're hearing this right, quintupling the dose of asthma medication, of steroids. A new study shows that larger doses not only don't help, they make things worse instead of better. According to, and I think this is a very telling comment, lead researcher Daniel Jackson, MD, the practice started based on the assumption that when symptoms worsened, the higher doses would reduce inflammation and therefore result in improvement. The assumption, however, turned out not to be true. To look at the issue, a study involved 254 children between the ages of 5 and 11 years of age with moderate asthma who had had at least one um, asthma exacerbation treated with glucoc glucocorticoids during the previous year. During uh, All of the kids were treated twice um, daily for 48 weeks with a low-dose inhaled steroid. During subsequent um, blind, double blind phase, half of the kids were randomized to quintuple the dose for seven days at the first sign of loss of control of asthma, while the other group continued to take the low dose. There was no statistical difference, uh, significant difference in the number of severe asthma exacerbations between the groups, and in fact, the exacerbation, exacerbation rate did reach the point of statistical significance, but it was actually slightly higher than the higher steroid group. Additionally, quintupling the dose led to diminished growth even for the short period of time that the kids were taking the steroids, the higher, ex the higher exposure. So higher doses for longer periods of time, which is often what happens with these kids once they start having exacerbations and things get worse, could have an even greater negative effect on health. Now, the reason why I wanted to cover this study is, first of all, if you have an asthmatic child, it's something that you might want to watch for, that as the child gets worse, more drugs is not necessarily better. But it also illustrates several recurring issues in medicine. Doctors continue to use protocols that are based on hypotheses and assumptions and sometimes just storytelling instead of insisting on evidence to support protocols that are used in practice. And then what happens is eventually somebody says, maybe we ought to do some research and see what's going on here. It's what happened in this case. And in this case, the practice is useless. The practice of increasing the steroid dosage is, is useless and in fact harmful for some kids. But now it's widely used and, and we get to the place where everyone knows, I put air quotes around, that, that you hear that all the time. Everybody knows that this is the thing to do. It's common practice. And so rarely does new evidence end up making a difference in the day-to-day -day practices of physicians who've taken on um, these practices based on the hypotheses and storytelling. So. Um, in the meantime, what's really frustrating, at least to me, sitting on the outside of the healthcare profession and looking in to a certain extent, is that things that could really make a difference like diet and weight loss and hydration and exercise are ignored. So more is not always better, particularly with drugs, and doctors should be con particularly conservative, I think, when treating children because the consequences of over-medicating um, can be even more serious. And one other thing I'll mention is in dealing with sick kids, I think we have a special, um, uh, and a special responsibility. And here's what I mean by this. We have kids who are getting so sick at such an early age that these kids are going to track into adulthood. They're starting their adult life in an extremely impaired state, and it's only going to get worse. So, you know, if you're 80 years old and you get diagnosed with asthma, it's probably still a better idea to change your diet, make sure you're drinking enough water, start exercising, and lose weight. But, but um, this, this is more toward the end of your life. When you're in this kind of condition as a nine-year-old or a seven-year-old, um, think about how many complications can develop based on not just the condition progressing, but all the medications that are used by the time a person is 80 years old, if they ever even make it that far. And I remember, um, I think it was, um, uh, I can't remember the guy's name actually, it was Surgeon General, the line in Forks Over Knives, if you saw the movie, where he says we might have the first generation of kids who don't live, outlive their parents, which is a pretty frightening thing that we all ought to think about and take seriously. All right, um, so if you have an asthmatic child, 
uh, dietary change, hydration, exercise, weight loss, those are the things that often improve asthma and reduce the need for medication, often even eliminate the need for medication. Okay, I always find uh, information about the gut microbiome really interesting. Um, so I have some news to report on that. The microbiome is made up of mostly beneficial bacteria and some pathogens. In a healthy gut, the population of pathogens remains pretty low and the beneficial bacteria are dominant. The bacteria that make up the gut microbiome have definite preferences for food. The pathogenic bacteria like animal foods and fat and protein and processed foods. The beneficial bacteria prefer fiber in particular and carbohydrate. So selectively feeding the pathogens can cause negative changes in the microbiome. More pathogens and fewer beneficial bacteria, and then this can increase the risk of disease and it can even increase the risk of death. So let's talk about C. diff uh, infection, for example. Small amounts of C. diff are found in the microbiome, but C. diff overgrowth and infection can develop after taking an antibiotic. This used to occur principally in hospital settings, but unfortunately C. diff infection is becoming more common in community settings, and people are developing C. diff infection, sometimes um, life-threatening infection. They haven't been near a hospital in years and years and years. Even more concerning is that C. diff is becoming more resistant to treatment with antibiotics, and this is, this is becoming concerning. I mean, we are, we are running to the end of um, antibiotics um, and their usefulness, and there just aren't many in the pipeline, so we should be a lot more conservative about that. Anyway, the overprescribing and overuse of antibiotics has contributed to this, but it doesn't entirely explain the situation. Another issue is that more virulent and aggressive strains of C. diff are developing in the microbiome. So researchers at Baylor University hypothesized that the reason why these aggressive strains of C. diff, like RT027, are thriving could be because our diets have changed. So to explore the theory, they looked at how a particularly virulent strain of RT027 in the large intestine, and that's where C. diff causes its symptoms and disease, how this um, particular strain responded to over 200 food items, including sugars, sugar alcohols, amino acids, and proteins. While a sugar called triolose was found to increase the growth of RT027 by five-fold, compared to other types of C. diff. Subsequently, the researchers looked at the effect of glucose or triolose alone on 21 strains of C. diff. While most strains grew on low levels of glucose, epidemic strains of this very virulent and aggressive RTO27 and another one, RTO78, grew on just very tiny amounts of triolose. When the strains were exposed to fluid samples from the small intestines of people who were considered to be eating kind of a normal American diet, two out of three samples induced expression of a particular gene which metabolizes triolose in R2, uh, RT027 strains. Uh, triolose also tended to increase the number of disease-causing toxins produced by this particular strain of C. diff. The researchers concluded that for most people who eat the way most Americans do, which is pretty terrible when you think about it, there's enough triolose in the diet of, of most people for the RTO27 strain to live on and thrive. So this could be partly diet induced. Now triolose occurs naturally in foods like mushrooms and yeast and it doesn't cause problems when it's consumed in its natural state. It's about half as sweet as sucralose, another artificial sweetener. And for a long time, it wasn't used in the food industry because it was really expensive. However, in the late 1990s, a new process was developed to, that allowed it to be manufactured really inexpensively from cornstarch, and that allowed food companies to use it in processed foods. Now, it's useful not only because it adds a sweet taste, but because it keeps the products moist and improves the texture. So you find it today in everything from meats, believe it or not, to desserts. Well, prior to the introduction of triolose in the food supply, virulent strains of C. diff were found in the microbiome, but there were very few outbreaks, and those that occurred were not as deadly. So this study shows a correlation, not a cause and effect relationship, but it does actually show a mechanism of action for how triolose increases the population of a very aggressive strain of C. diff and increases the production of toxins. Now, another factor that adds weight to this particular study, even though it is observational, 
His other studies, which have shown similar effects of food additives on the gut microbiome. A Cleveland Clinic researcher found that feeding mice maltodextrin, very common ingredient in processed and refined foods, resulted in thinning of the mucus barrier and increased population of a strain of E. coli that is commonly found in the guts of Crohn's patients. Another research group showed that polysorbate 80, um, again, many of us haven't probably had any of this for a long time, but it's a very common ingredient in highly processed and refined foods, um, caused, caused degradation of the mucus barrier in mice and also induced low-level inflammation and colitis in mice who were predisposed to develop colitis. What to do about this? Well, start by remembering that when you eat, you're not just eating for one, you're eating for 100 trillion. That's about how many bacteria are in the gut of a healthy person. Um, choose your foods wisely. The good bacteria prefer that you eat according to the informed food pyramid, which those of you who are members have seen. While the pathogens are hoping you keep on eating meat, cheese, and refined foods. If you're like a lot of people who've damaged your microbiome due to your diet and lifestyle habits or from taking medications, that was me when I started down this path years ago, high quality probiotics are advisable. The relationship between humans and our bacteria is really, really important. The bacteria rely on us to feed them and we rely on them for many, many things, including nutrient absorption and protection from disease. I think that what's happened is that humans have largely broken the contract of not feeding the bacteria the way that they're supposed to. So you can make amends by adopting a better diet and taking probiotics to repair your gut. All right, that's all for today. And in fact, all for the week, as usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it. And I'll be back to you next week with more news.